true and living God. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Both is the fourth Sunday in Epiphany, but I think it's also the AFC Championship game, so I have to acknowledge that at some point in my sermon here before I get chased out of the town. The prophet is not welcome in their hometown. <laughs> Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully. The portion of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians that we just heard read is perhaps some of the most well-known bits of scripture that there are. I imagine that's true even for those who have never picked up a Bible or read it in the Bible. Perhaps so well known that it might not even be known as scripture to some. Perhaps just a lovely bit of poetry read at a wedding. There's something meet and right and good about the fact that it is a ubiquitous presence at weddings. After all, the wedding is about love and that is, and these words are some of the most beautiful words written about that topic. But here's the thing, Paul isn't talking about romantic love at all. He has nothing to say to two folks choosing to make vows to one another in a pretty church or a a nice barn on a hillside or whatever it might be. He isn't doing premarital counseling with the faithful in Corinth. But Paul is making a claim, an, an eternal and unending and overwhelming truth about the world. Paul is proclaiming an imagination for the world as it can be, as is truly there. Addressing a band of folks who were fighting and arguing in Corinth, Paul spent his previous chapter of the letter writing to them about gifts, about spiritual gifts, about being one body and the need for each part of the body to do what it has been given to do in order for the body to fully realize what it was made for. He will go on from this point today to continue his exhortations on this subject. But here in the middle of those, that discussion about giftedness, about the body, about the people of God inhabited and made real, here in the middle of that, Paul gives us this famous passage. In so doing, he reminds them and us that without love, there is actually no such need for these gifts. Without love, the gifts we have been given will fail. Without love, the gifts we have been given are incomplete. Even prophecy, even these big, and majestic and mighty gifts, even they will cease. Without love, they are nothing. Love, in fact, isn't even a gift, but rather the point of all gifts. And just as he has finished up that famous bit of poetry every wedding loves to hear, Paul holds out another deep truth about this kind of love and about the way the world just seems to work. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. Right within these words is a very clear recognition of a stark difference between now and then. Now we see dimly, now we know only in part, but then, But then, whenever that is, then we will see face to face. Then we will know fully. Paul simultaneously knows of a reality, a truth, an imagination, a way of being for this world that is out there and true, and is at the same time fully aware that we cannot see it clearly or know it fully now. The New Testament scholar Matt Skinner says the magnitude of Paul's confidence in God's faithfulness gets matched by the level of obliviousness we share when it comes to understanding God and God's ways. From our perspective, we can detect only murky reflections in a distorted mirror. Our vision strains to peer into a riddle. We are wading knee deep in water with our backs turned to a vast ocean. I have required glasses to see fully and clearly for about the last 27 years, save one hour, give or take. There's one hour when I went home with contacts in my eyes, having struggled for what seemed like an eternity at the eye doctor's office to put them in. There was that one hour when they seemed to work, but they got too itchy and I rubbed my eyes and they came out. And I swore them off forever. 
except for one hour since I was eight years old, I have worn glasses. I still remember what it was like, and all of you who require the same to see clearly may very well too, to sit in the classroom, always in the first row, of course, to sit in the classroom at school and not to be able to see the board and the work that was assigned and those things that they used to call overhead projectors up on the wall. I remember what it was like to not see the balls flying at my face in gym class or on the playground. I remember what it was like to sort of be able to see, to make out a shape more or less of what I should be seeing or think I could sometimes actually see and didn't need glasses after all. There were times I would trick myself. It was those glasses, those super stylish glasses of the mid-90s that brought into focus what I couldn't see otherwise, that took the world as it was and sharpened it so that I could see it more accurately and fully and truly. You who see clearly with no such help can imagine that feeling when you are looking out at the horizon and you start to see something come into focus that could either be your best friend, a beautiful tree, or some violent animal charging right at you until moment by moment the truth comes into focus. One of the realities of not being able to see very well is that from time to time, even without my glasses, I can glimpse a bit of whatever I'm looking at quite clearly, even for a fleeting moment. If I squint just right, if I look just right, there's that split second when all looks as it should. I wonder, I wonder if this isn't our experience of the kind of love that Paul is writing about too. We are wading knee deep in water with our backs turned to a vast ocean. The love that Paul envisions is bigger and broader and more generous, more unimaginable than any of us can see and know in this lifetime. That is all true. And yet it is also true that we have seen it and known it. We have encountered it. I, I would imagine that you wouldn't be here if you hadn't. We have seen it and known it even quite clearly, even for what now seems like a fleeting moment. The squint of our eyes and the steadfast love of a friend who didn't need to show up for us, but still did. The surprising presence of some small sign of love, a meal, a ride, a hug when we least expected it. The companionship and shared journey with a loved one who didn't have to go out of their way for us again. The overwhelming presence of God on a mountaintop or in an open prairie or sitting on your couch in your living room with 13 seconds left in a football game. <laughs> the thing about seeing in a mirror dimly, the thing about only detecting a murky reflection in a distorted mirror is that you are in fact seeing something. It is clear, even if not fully seen, that there is an image there. There is something for our eyes and our hearts and our souls to behold. There is something fuller beyond. And just because it is true that now we cannot fully know and that now we see dimly does not make God's perfect love for you any less true or real. Just as the ocean is behind our backs, even as we wade in its waters, so too is God's perfect love for you, true and real and sustaining all that you are, creating and recreating you and this whole world day by day even if we cannot fully understand it, even if we don't believe it some days. And if that is true, and it is, if that is true, then we who have set, have set before us, it seems to me, two ways to live our lives. On the one hand, we can work with all that we are to be as busy as possible, as worried as possible, as scared as possible, as white-knuckled as possible, as frantic as possible, to engineer a life for ourselves that our world might call good or successful or complete. That is an option that is out there. And it is an option that is held before us as the way to go day by day. Just work harder, just pick yourself up and keep going, just worry more, you'll make it. Or we can go another way. Or we can go another way. We can go the way of rest and trust, go the way of not fully seeing now and yet still walking, go the way of only being able to make out a murky reflection and yet believing that behind that mirror that we see through now is an image of a love that is beyond our imagination, a love that has created us, a love that beholds us, 
and calls us beloved. We can go this way and remember that this whole thing we call life, this whole project of our existence, is not dependent on us at all. It isn't for us to control and worry about and grasp onto tighter and tighter. It is just simply true that you are beloved of God. And there is nothing you need to do to prove or earn that identity. There is nothing that can shake you from it. There is nothing that can keep you from fully knowing the kind of love that Paul imagines and that God promises for you. I believe that the entire invitation of the Christian life is to become more and more aware of our identity as beloved. It is the, this identity that inspired our very creation. It is this identity that sustains all that we do. It is this identity that we bear throughout all of the changes and chances of life. There is no amount of busyness or worry that can cause us to discover an identity or truth for our lives. We cannot generate such an identity on our own. That is the good news of this day, and that is the image that is behind the mirror that we can only see partially now. It is simply true that we are God's beloved. And so too is everyone else. Full stop, no exceptions. Such an identity, that of God's beloved, is not only something we are called to rest in, but it also asks something of us each day. We live in a world that seems to be nearly the exact opposite of the kind of love that Paul describes. There's a world that cultivates impatience, that seems to hold up selfishness as a central ideal, that boasts in getting ahead at the expense of others, that rejoices in untruths and lies, that insists on its own way despite anyone else. Oftentimes, these seem to be the waters that we are wading in, and these waters feel like they are rising and rising. Let us be a people who hold out another way, a way of love that knows that the vast ocean of God's unimaginable love is deeper and broader. Let us be a people who know and make known that all that we do and are is found in a love that is patient and kind, that does not insist on its own way, that rejoices in truth that believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, a love that never ends. May you know yourself to be swimming in these abundant waters day by day. May you, may we, make known that same love with all that we are.